Hi everyone, and welcome to this webinar about web security considerations for GraphQL. We're a data theorem. Uh, we've been around since 2013, and we help all sorts of companies and organizations prevent AppSec data breaches. And today, I'm going to talk about GraphQL APIs, more specifically, security considerations and things to think about when it comes to securing GraphQL APIs. Um, I'll start with a quick intro to what GraphQL is, then go over a few security topics related to GraphQL, and lastly, a conclusion. So first of all, you may or may not be familiar with GraphQL. What is it? Um, it's a new technology or approach at building APIs. Uh, and this is a quote from the PayPal blog, where they say, when we took a closer look, we found that UI developers were spending less than a third of their time actually building UI. The rest of that time spent was figuring out where and how to fetch data, filtering or mapping over the data, and orchestrating many API calls. That's from the, the PayPal engineering blog. So GraphQL is a technology to build APIs that's designed to help developers essentially iterate faster on their web and mobile applications. And the way it works at a high level is based on a schema, which is what you can see in the middle of the screen here. A schema describes the different kinds of data that the API can return. And in this example here, we have a schema with uh, a type that's a post, essentially a blog post, with a title, um, a body, and an author. And then another type is a user, a user that has a first name, a last name, uh, a flag that describes whether that user is an admin or not. So that's the schema. That's a GraphQL schema. That's exactly the, the, how, how that file looks like. And using that schema, a client and a server can communicate and exchange data. The client on the left can send queries to the server using the schema. The client is usually a mobile application or a web application. And it needs to fetch data from the server in order to display things to the user, you know, to populate the UI. And to do so, it sends a query such as the one we're seeing here, which is a query to, to uh, retrieve all the blog posts. Um, it sends a query to the server and the server who also uses that schema, that GraphQL schema, can then uh, understand the, the client's query and return the data that was uh, asked for. So that's uh, how it works at a very high level. Um, and so if you look at a website that uses GraphQL, a web application, uh, you can see it in Chrome and it looks like this. You can see the query uh, at the top, and then some additional uh, data, um, and it's querying things about communities, again, to, to populate the UI of that web application. And then this is the response, um, you know, giving a list of communities, in this case, uh, with all sorts of information within each community. Um, so like I said, the reason why developers uh, have started using GraphQL is that it gives them full control when it comes to uh, fetching data from the server uh, within their application. And so essentially, once you've defined that schema, which describes all the types of data that are available for querying, you can come up with any kind of query that you want um, based on that schema, which is very powerful and very flexible. So in this example here, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty simple example, but you can ask for specific users or for all the blog posts. So essentially, you can ask for any combination of data and fields based on that schema. Um, and so that means that you, ha you, you have less back and forth with the backend team when you're building an application, because instead of asking them to expose some new fields or some new piece of data, you can just create a new query that gets it. Um, 
it's, it usually provides a better performance because you have to do less network requests compared to a, a normal REST API. Uh, usually with REST APIs, you have to do a lot of requests or more than one request to get all the data that you need to uh, populate the UI. And with GraphQL, it can be done with just one network request. Um, like I said, it's easier to, to iterate over an application, fetch more data, change what kind of data is being fetched and displayed to the user. So it's very powerful. And lastly, you can use the same GraphQL API for like all your clients, you know, mobile applications, web applications. So overall, um, you know, for an engineering team, it, it allows them to just move faster and deliver more features uh, in less time. And that's why it, it's so powerful. Um, and so another way to think about it is if you compare a REST API and a GraphQL API and trying to uh, implement the same functionality, which in this example is uh, some API to fetch users uh, and then again fetching the blog post written by a specific user. So on the left you see all the uh, REST API endpoints to do uh, what an application would, would need in terms of actions, such as again, getting a list of users, deleting a specific user. And, and the big thing about GraphQL, as you can see on the right, is that all, 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 the, all that logic, all these actions, they're all inside this one GraphQL API that can kind of do it all, depending on the query that you send. Um, so these two APIs, REST on the left, GraphQL on the right, they can do the same things. Um, but you can see how, how uh, the structure is very different. Um, and so in terms of security, uh, talking about GraphQL security, the first thing to mention is that, that, of course, there are a lot of similarities with REST security and REST APIs. Uh, a big one uh, is authentication issues, essentially who should have access to my API. And what we've seen uh, a lot is when authentication is just not implemented. So you have an API uh, on the internet, but anybody can call into that API. Anybody can access it. You don't need an API key or any kind of credential. And that that these kinds of issues, they apply both to REST APIs and GraphQL API. If your GraphQL API doesn't ask for any API key or credential, it's the exact same problem. Um, another similarity in terms of, of security issues is rate limiting. So um, you know, when you have an API, you do want to have a mechanism in place that limits how many requests a specific user can send uh, in order to, to not allow attackers to kind of flood the API with requests. And whether it's, you know, Re a REST API or GraphQL API, it's, that still applies. We'll see around the end of this presentation, there are some specificities, specificities with GraphQL uh, kind of denial of service attacks, uh, but in terms of rate limiting, it's the same. Uh, it's the same issue whether you're using REST APIs or GraphQL APIs. And then, lastly, uh, when it comes to similarities with REST, um, injection is a similar problem in REST and in GraphQL. Um, so if you can provide parameters you know, input to the API. So for example, if you're fetching a blog post, you may be able to provide the ID of the blog post you're interested in. And that's where injection can occur. And a famous example of an injection attack is SQL injection. And so whether you're using REST or GraphQL, the, you know, as soon as a user can supply some, some parameters, they may try to inject, uh, to perform injection attacks, such as SQL injection. So that is the same whether you're using REST or GraphQL. And so for these issues, um, the same kind of security controls can be used. Um, so again, for authentication issues, making sure you do have authentication in place, you can have unit tests for that. Um, rate limiting, having a mechanism that, that, that kicks in when the same user starts sending a lot of requests. Um, and SQL injection, um, Usually, the best way to prevent these is to use um, a framework for, for 
talking to the database that does not even allow for SQL injection. Things like stored uh, queries um, and of course avoiding um, string concatenation when building these kinds of SQL requests. So sa same thing, nothing new here. Uh, now when you want to do testing for these issues, it can be a bit different because you, the, whatever tool or script you'll, you'll be using um, needs to be able to connect to a GraphQL API. Uh, and connecting is the same actually, but sending a valid request is different when you're talking GraphQL. So you, you may have to tweak your tools and, and make them more aware of the, you know, how to send a GraphQL request. Um, now, going into the differences and what's different with, with GraphQL compared to other APIs. Um, one thing that, that's kind of important with GraphQL is a mechanism called introspection. Um, so introspection is uh, a built-in mechanism. It's a core mechanism of GraphQL which um, allows a user to, to ask for the schema. So call the API and request the schema, uh, which is the, this file that we saw at the beginning. Um, and the thing is, once you have the schema, this tells you everything about the GraphQL API. What data can you fetch? How to fetch it? Um, and so it's kind of a map of the what the GraphQL API can do. So once you have the schema, you know a lot about the API. And when introspection is enabled, anybody can just ask for, for, for that schema. In some cases, it's fine. Uh, it could be by design, for example. Um, if you use kind of a, a a public GraphQL API, such as GitHub's GraphQL API, by design they will want to expose the schema because that's how you can uh, query the, the API and, and build something out of it. Um, but in some cases, it may there may not be you know a use case for exposing the schema, and that's when uh, you you want to turn off introspection, disable introspection if there is no use case for exposing the schema. Also, retrieving the schema doesn't really, it's just information, uh, but if there's no use case for this, you can just disable introspection in your GraphQL API. That's like the kind of first basic thing to, to think about when deploying a GraphQL API. Um, another thing about the schema is that sometimes, it's not about the schema itself, but it would be, it would be dis exposed or disclosed by the schema. Um, in some cases, the schema is automatically generated from the code, um, which is very convenient. Um, and then the API, the GraphQL API just kind of automatically exposes whatever schema and the data that it references. It kind of just makes this, make this available automatically. Um, and depending on how the schema is auto-generated, for example, it could be auto-generated from the actual database schema, um, in which case it's possible that data that's not, that was not meant to be accessible via an API, uh, that was not meant to be exposed, uh, just becomes part of the GraphQL API. And there's an example of this here, very basic, where um, a schema that's, that was kind of auto-generated um, Re, you know, exposed credit card information um, because again, it's auto-generated. It just took whatever was in the code or the DB schema and then made it available as an API, which is very convenient. That's why you, you would use uh, auto-generation. But at the same time, if if you know you're not reviewing the schema, making sure everything that's in it uh, is is meant to be there and to be exposed, um, you could you could disclose uh, private data as is the case here. So it's another thing which again goes back to the schema, making sh just reviewing what's in the schema, uh, the types that are describing it, because the second a type or a data is described in the schema, then it's available via the API, which is by design. Um, now, so this is a big one for APIs in general, authorization. So authorization is about figuring out whether, for example, user A, if I'm user A, do I have access to this blog post uh, with ID 123? That's authorization. Um, so it's not authentication. Authentication is 
do I have access to this API? Yes or no? Authorization happens after that. Um, and again, it's do I have access to this specific piece of data that I'm trying to fetch? Or am I allowed to make this specific change uh, that I want to make? So uh, authorization in GraphQL is a bit tricky because it, ha it has to be implemented kind of deep in uh, the server code uh, that, that takes care of the kind of GraphQL magic. Um, and this part of the code is called the resolver. The re a resolver is essentially a piece of code that's responsible for give for, for finding the data that the query is asking for and this is for each type so for example in this example with the credit card on the right uh, you would have a resolver that's the credit card resolver and so when there's a query that's asking for specific data about the credit card this piece of code or this resolver would be responsible for querying the database asking for the credit card data and uh, sending it back. So that's what the resolver is. And so in the first example in, in our schema, we had user and blog posts. And so same thing, there would be a resolver for fetching users and a resolver for fetching blog posts. And so going back to authorization, this is where the, the authorization logic has to be implemented. It's in that resolver code. Um, and, and what's interesting is that the best practice for, for resolvers is, and this is from the paper on engineering blog, the best practice is to write resolvers that are readable, maintainable, testable, not too clever, uh, and as thin as possible, right? But going back to what I said about authorization, um, you know, this is an example from Stack Overflow about how do I implement authorization in my GraphQL API? And the top answer was, We've built a permission system that guards our private fields, private fields being data that should not be returned to all users. A permission system that guards our private fields and mutations at the resolver level. By using Python decorators, we wrap every resolver function that should be private with the proper permission check. If the user doesn't have the permission to access that field, we raise a GraphQL error and return null for that field. So as you can see, um, it makes sense, or maybe it doesn't, but it, the main thing is that it sounds pretty complex, right? It's, if you go back to the best practice, which is to make this part of the code as simple and maintainable as possible, and then when you start implementing authorization, you have to do all these things. So that's why uh, it's pretty tricky to do, because you have to implement this authorization logic in code that should be simple, but authorization is pretty complex by itself. Um, and to give another example, this is how it looks, uh, for example, in the in the in Graphene, which is um, a Python framework for for GraphQL for doing GraphQL. Um, and so this is the authorization I'm talking about, which is user based filtering which is the user may or may not have access to uh, some specific blog posts, right? And, I mean, this is pretty small here, but, again, this is deep in the code base and in the API. Um, and there may be a lot more logic here, which is where the, the, the data is fetched from the database. Uh, but this is where your, your authorization check needs to happen. So, um, I think it can lead to, to some, some level of complexity. And the other thing is that there's no one-size-fits-all solution. You, you know, as a developer, you have to come up with your approach. Uh, there's no like, uh, standard way of doing this. Um, and like I said, there's inherent complexity, uh, which can increase the potential for mistakes. Um, and when you have a, a, an authorization issue, it means that some user was able to get data that they're not supposed to, to see. Um, you know, even in a REST API, authorization can be pretty tricky to, to get right. Um, but I think in GraphQL, it, because GraphQL is still kind of a new technology, authorization is not something that's easy to do. And because there's no standardized approach for implementing or testing authorization, I think it's, 
a potential security uh, challenge for sure when it comes to deploying GraphQL API. Now I'll talk about a few other things with GraphQL security. Uh, in this case, related to denial of service. So there's at least a couple ways uh, that are very unique to GraphQL uh, that can lead to um, resource exhaustion or denial of service. So one example of that is um, query depth. So, you know, the whole point of GraphQL is that it's very flexible. You can, you can craft all sorts of queries to get exactly the data that you need uh, in your application. But with that flexibility, you know, comes risks. Um, and this is an example on the left of a query. I mean, obviously, when you look at it, it clearly something's wrong. Um, but that's a valid query that you can send to a GraphQL API. And so it's very nested, right? And what it does, it asks for a user, a specific user with the ID ABC. And then it asks for all the blog posts from that user, written by that user. And then for each post, uh, it queries for the author of the blog posts. And then for each author, it queries for all the blog posts they've written. And then for each post, the author of that post. So again and again and again and again, and you can nest it even more. Um, there's no limit to how far you can go. And when uh, you send this kind of query to an, a GraphQL API, it's very likely that it will uh, just do a denial, denial of service on the GraphQL API. Um, and, and these kinds of, this, ha this is possible because there's a cyclic relation in the schema where you know, a blog post has an author and an author can write blog posts. So, but these kinds of uh, relations are very normal in the GraphQL schema in general. So it's nothing that's very specific to this example. This is this happens very much. Um, it's very often that in the GraphQL API you would have something uh, like this that that's possible. So and so the for this scenario, the, the way to prevent that is that you have to set up a maximum query depth on your GraphQL API. So if you look at this query, uh, each uh, layer or each you know, each indentation is a, is a is, you know adds one to the depth to the query depth. So we're here we'll probably at like ten maybe, but you should always configure a maximum depth of maybe three or four depends on your use case and your API. But definitely you know set a limit so that uh, an attacker cannot do a denial of, denial of service using this. And most GraphQL. Uh, server libraries have a way to configure this, so it really depends on which one you're using. Another way to do a denial of service with GraphQL, you know, that's specific to GraphQL, is by sending a very complex query. And uh, this is an example here on the left. So you have a query that asks for the first 1,000 users in the database. Um, and then for each user, it asks for the last 100 blog posts that they wrote. Um, and so if you count everything, that's 100,000 uh, 100, records or nodes requested by a single query, by this very small query, uh, which describes a lot of data to be returned. And so when the server receives a query like this, it will have to do a lot of work. It will have to query a lot of data or retrieve a lot of data from the database before it's able to even reply, to, before it's able to send a response. And so that's the perfect scenario for denial of service because you can send a very small message, or in this case, a very small query, and the server has to do a lot of work to uh, fulfill that, that query. And so um, the solution to this, it's a bit tricky because there's no, just like authorization, there's no one size fits all solution, but the overall idea is that uh, you have to evaluate complexity of incoming queries in your GraphQL API. Um, the tricky part is that 
it's not always supported by all GraphQL frameworks, and it's usually pretty different depending on which framework you're using. Um, and uh, as an example, this is one library that can do it um, for, you know, if you're using GraphQL JS. Um, it's kind of like an add-on that can measure the complexity of a query. And then you can set a limit, uh, you know, if the, query, the incoming query is more than X complexity, it's a number, uh, don't process this query. But again, the tricky part here is that there's no standardized way of doing it. It's still um, kind of up and coming, so it depends which uh, GraphQL framework you're using, but it's definitely something you should look into. Um, and this was, you know, the few security uh, concepts that I wanted to uh, talk about in regards to GraphQL. Um, and in conclusion, so one thing that we've seen a lot is that organizations are already using GraphQL. Uh, and it's not always clear that they know it. It's something we've seen a lot at Data Um And that's because developer teams, they have to you know, release features, make the, their application better. So they're, they're going to move fast. They're not going to ask for permission. And they're going to use whatever technology is the best for uh, what they need to do. And in, in some scenarios, it will be GraphQL. And so it's important also to know, to just even know what, the, what GraphQL APIs are, uh, have been deployed by your organization. Um, and that's why discovery is key. Um, and then, as I mentioned, GraphQL security can be, is in some ways similar to REST APIs. Uh, and I talked about authentication and rate limiting. And so these concepts are pretty much the same. But also GraphQL has some unique uh, challenges or security um, risks. Um, and I think it's because the tools and the libraries are, are a lot newer. They're still kind of new. Uh, and so less mature, and so there's a lack of convention and kind of known best practices. And we saw that, for example, with authorization and with the complexity, query complexity problem I just talked about. There isn't a one kind of approved way or known way of, of dealing with this. It still, it still depends on which library you're using and a few other things. So again, the, the ecosystem is still not I mean, obviously not as mature as the rest, but um, and that's why we are seeing this kind of lack of convention. And lastly, there is uh, there are some instances of GraphQL being complex by design uh, when it comes to authorization and resolvers, as I uh, just talked about. And I think in some cases it's more complex than if you had to implement the same logic in a REST API, for example. So this was the webinar about GraphQL security. Um, if you'd like to see a demo of the product, feel free to uh, browse to this URL and uh, reach out to us. And thank you for your time, and have a great day.